Good morning, I'm Tom Garfield. We'll be getting into the seven laws of teaching, just to make sure you're in the right place, the right time. I have to tell you that in Logos's history, uh, the seven laws have taken a uh, rather large, prominent place, but we didn't have the real McCoy right from the start, which was rather a shock to find out. What we started with was the original that we thought, book by Gregory, but he wrote it in 1884. In 1917, it was purged, essentially, expunged of all biblical references by a group of people in the, uh, I believe it was Princeton, but don't hold me to that. And when we got it in the early 80s, we used it quite a bit and found it very, very delightful and helpful. But just a few years back, we were at a conference like this, and a young man came up and presented to us a photocopy of the original and said this was uh, something he had found. And we looked at it and were just shocked, pleasantly pleased, to discover all the biblical and Christian references that were included in it. And so now you can get uh, the original version, the unabridged version, uh, from our table and from other places. But you'll be delighted to discover that it has all sorts of references to the way our Lord taught, for instance. And that is exactly where he got much of, uh, Gregory got much of his authority for putting together these seven laws, identifying these seven laws. Now, I also need to say this. Teachers all over the world are going to be teaching well, not because they know the seven laws, but because they're doing them. And that's the difference. They don't need to know the secret formula to be able to do the good job that they're doing. And so what Gregory has done is distilled good teaching into seven laws that can be identified, so you might as well know what you're going to be doing, and identify them for us so that we can follow them very clearly and repeat them year after year after year. Well, let's find out just a bit about this guy, John Milton Gregory. Obviously, his parents were somewhat literate. They enjoyed uh, the work of John Milton. John Milton Gregory was born in 1822, and he lived to be uh, about 76 years old by my math. He died in 1898. He was a godly man, did a number of uh, professions, mostly related around education. I say mostly because at one point he was a lawyer, but we'll forgive him that. But he was a teacher as well and a pastor at times, but mostly his life's work was in education. He loved to teach. He loved to make sure that students were learning. He became the head of a classical school in Detroit, Michigan, which endears him to me on two counts because I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan originally. Yeah, we got some, got some Michiganders here. All right, very good. Go blue. Still cheer for the Wolverines, of all things. But he also uh, he, he hung around the Midwest there, the Michigan, Ohio area for Illinois area for quite a while. He became the state superintendent of education in Michigan, president of Kalamazoo College, and he headed up and organized the new, what is now University of Illinois. Okay. That was what really became his, uh, his heart's work. He was there for 13 years. And it was during this time that he published this book, The Seven Laws of Teaching. So it precedes, if you have been familiar with some possible other lists of rules or laws on teaching, this book precedes them all. Okay? He, he, he got the jump on them all. 1884 was when it was first published. And it was originally intended for Sunday school teachers. He felt that there needed to be a little bit more structure to how students were taught in Sunday school. Now, whether or not you, you buy into Sunday school is an idea, that's not really the point here. The point was that he felt that any teaching that was going to take place there uh, should be of an exceptional quality, especially if you're going to be instructing young people in the Word of God. So I hope you can see it's not too much of a stretch for us in classical Christian schools to seek to apply his ideas. Also in a I don't know what kind of splash it made, but it must have made some kind of impact because it was revised in about 1917 and that was the copy that we originally found or were purchased uh, back in the 80s, 1980s. 
was the abridged version. And what had happened is some uh, dear people, I believe from Princeton, had expunged really almost every Christian or biblical reference from the book. And we still got it. We didn't know that. We got it as this was the only copy there was, uh, we being Logos School. And we, we found this and started using it for our own teachers for training them. And we found it delightful and helpful and really had no idea that there was any other version available. Well, um, just a few years ago, uh, less than 10 years ago, a young man came up to one of our teachers at a conference like this and said, did you know that this is the original version of the seven laws? He had a photocopy that he'd found somewhere and he gave it to us and we about fell over. You know, it's sort of like, I, I, the only thing I can credit it to is when I found out after having a very secular education that our country was founded on Christian principles. I had no idea. I don't know about you. I hope that's not a shock to you. Um, if it is, you're in for a world of discovery. But it really was like that. It was like this, I couldn't even really say an epiphany in that total sense because it was brought to us. But it was just this amazing realization that we'd been robbed for quite a few years of the full power, if you can put it that way, and impact and richness of the original seven laws. So we quickly realized that we needed to put this in as many people's hands as possible, certainly our own teachers. And so we did, and you can now get the original version as uh, it looks like here. We sell it at the Logos table. I think there may be some other places, but you want to go there. Um, how was that for crass commercialism? But you'll notice it says unabridged. This is the real deal. This is as Gregory meant it to be written and published. So don't settle for anything less. Okay, and this is what we're going to go by. But we just found it was delightful because it's just strewn with biblical allusions and examples. Hence Gregory's intention of, uh, for Sunday school teachers. But how much apt, more apt is it for us who don't have the kids just for a little while on Sunday mornings. We have them five days a week, all day long. 